Hi and welcome. I'm Sarah Watts and uh, I'm from Stockholm, Sweden, and I'm very happy to be my very first time here in Köln or Cologne, as you say in English. Uh, today we're going to have a mastermind session where you work on your business because this time at JAB we had so many good sessions when it comes to working in your business and getting more skills in our tool belt. But now we have to see how we can implement it in our businesses. And with my help today, I have Joe and Rod coming from the uh, Zoom link that we have attached. So say hi and uh, welcome to Joe and Rod. Hi there. I, uh, it's very hard to understand what you're saying. There's a lot of echo in the room, but if you're uh, looking to, to know a little bit about me, I'm Joe, I'm from Canada. And uh, most people know me from joejoomla.com. I've been at JAB in the past in, in person, and I'm sorry I can't be there in person today, but it's nice to be here virtually. I'm midway between uh, Toronto and Niagara Falls, Ontario, in a city called Guelph. Cool. And Rod? Well, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. I'm not sure what time it is there. Uh, my name is Rod Martin. I'm a business owner, Joomla user since Joomla 1.0. Uh, used to be the vice president of OSM for a period of time with both of, uh, on the board with both of these guys. And uh, just really happy to be here. I'm outside of Cincinnati, Ohio, in a tiny little town called Dillsboro, Indiana. And I'm actually sitting in a parking lot at the moment, so uh, I'll have my microphone turned off for most of this. but. It's great to be there. I love JAB. It's such a great event. I wish I was there in person. Cool. Welcome. So I'm going to switch you guys off for now when it comes to this. So please mute yourself and uh, we will go on with the training and we will see you pretty soon again. OK, so as I said before, we have been using a lot of our time learning new skills. And now we have to find out a way to make that happen in our businesses. And we had really, really good sessions on how to to work in our business and also on our business when it comes to storytelling with Kiera. And we had really good marketing and business advice on how to find our target market and so forth. And those things can also tie into this subject. So it's time to work on your business. How many of you are allocating time every week to work on your business? Good because I think that we as service providers and extension developers, we're so into the trenches of actually delivering service and hours and time and value to our clients, but we sometimes tend to forget that we do not give them, uh, give attention to our own company the same way we do for our clients. And it's time to change that because there is a really good way of actually benefiting from moving into earning more money. And as a former president of, of Joomla, I realized that it's really, really hard for Joomla to get the volunteer time to be sustainable over time and also to get some sponsorships and event attendees. And all of those things comes into that we in the ecosystem of Joomla do not earn enough money. If we earn enough money, we have the possibility to go outside from our business and actually get more education for ourselves. So we can attend more conferences and we can go and share our new knowledge that we have achieved and the experience that we have with others, which is so important for events like this. And we also have the possibility to, um, to work on more sponsorship if we have money to spend. And if we have employees, we can also maybe allocate, or our own time, allocate a few hours every week on a sustainable basis to our teams that we are volunteering to in the sessions. So this session means that it's good for us to earn money, because if we have money, we can share that with the community overall. So that was my point today, that we, we need to do that. And I think that we are so good in sharing code 
we're so sh good at teaching each other how to build good businesses I in the sense of how we are good web developers. But sometimes we tend to forget that there is another side of us actually making the money, that we do not share enough of our business intelligence or business experience and advice with each other. And if we do, we will actually grow faster. We will not go into the same rabbit holes as other people have done. And we can learn from their experience so we can do our own mistakes and we can share them and our wins with them. And that's why I started the Pixbro Labs live show. And I did that in June last year. And uh, most of my guests have never been on a live show on Facebook before. So this is pretty scary to say yes to something unknown. And Jason was, I just have to give him a really good shout out because he said, if you ask me, I will be there. So he was my first guest. And he was very open and very savvy when it comes to talking about his business and his business journey. And this has now turned into these many people that have been my guests so far. So Kiera, who's in the room, you have been on, on the show, and uh, you are going to be on my next episode. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we're going to continue doing this because this is something that I think is really important to share our knowledge with each other. And this is recorded so anyone can see it when they want and go back and forth to it. But it's not usually enough to have maybe 60 minutes of inspiration or 45 minutes of inspiration. We need more. So in this session, I want to talk about how to get clear on your business. And this is an exercise I do frequently in my business because I think it's hard for us to focus what we're gonna spend our time on and our focus on when we are, um, let's say, um, when we have half an hour, like a half an hour or half a day that we can spend on working on something that can improve our business, we might do the wrong thing because it's exciting and it's something we know. But that might not be the most important thing and it might not be really clear on where in the business this task or this improvement actually comes from. I use a business model canvas to do this. And I do it with my, if I have a customer that is specific, that I share, like I service with a service, or if that's uh, extensions that we sell, we have different ones for different kind of purposes. But you can do it for all your business if you want to do it at once, if you have almost the same services and almost the same target market. So have you seen this before? Yeah. So it's open sourced and you can go and download it. It's just Google it and get it down. And I think that we're going to do some practical work. So if you have some paper and pen or a computer, I would love you to use it because I think this could be something that will start a conversation after this short training. So the first thing is the value proposition. We talked about it before during some sessions that we should not talk about, I'm going to sell Joomla. I'm going to sell something that is a, a solution to a problem that our clients have. And be super specific on how that is. And since we have some more training this weekend, we now have more things that we can put into our value proposition. Uh, did anyone see the workflow new functionality that comes into uh, to, um, Joomla? That's going to be a lot of different ways of doing things and maybe can service clients that we couldn't service before. So that might change our value proposition for a specific segment. There's also other extensions that we have seen uh, at this conference that also can add on to that business proposition. So think about what kind of gift you can give to your clients. Because they are there frustrated, lacking something, and they would like you to help them solve that problem. And can you be as good as Kiera is when it comes to like do the storytelling around this in this area? Listen to her um, session again and see what you can actually pinpoint into your value proposition that we learned from Kiera. Because I think that we the more we can identify ourselves with our clients' needs and their situation right now, 
it's easier for us to say, hey, come with me on this journey, and here is the stopping point, and you're going to have this result, and you're going to feel this way. And I'm going to take you on this journey with me to make sure that that happens. And I think that's a key point of the value proposition to really be clear and also make it engaging when you do it. It can also be that you now have a better way of getting your value proposition delivered to your clients because you met people at this conference that you haven't connected with before, or maybe you have went into a conversation where you found similarities or add extra value to your clients. And now you can go back to them and say, I have this new idea of how to do this. So we had some sessions yesterday about GDPR. There are a session right now on GDPR. And that's something that we can go to our clients and say, hey, we can help you with your GDPR compliance. And we can help you with that. That was something that we couldn't do before in the same kind of sense because we didn't have the knowledge and the tools to do it. And now we do, and we can put that into the value proposition. And also looking into that when you have found a partner that you think that you have something that you can gain with, see if you can bundle your service with them. Because that's going to give you better margins and a better value proposition. The next thing I look at is the customer segments. And uh, I usually talk a lot about avatars and that you have to be really good at getting to know your ID client as good as you know your best friend. When you know what they are thinking about and you can communicate what they are thinking about, they will feel like, wow, this really resonates with me. It's like you just went into my head and listened to my internal conversation. And that is nothing that you can find on metrics or things like that, but you have to talk to your clients and you have to talk to your ID clients. Check out if you have a long list of clients currently and see which ones you want to keep that fits into that ID client. If you have people on that list that do not longer fit that list, find a way of how you can actually give them a referral to someone else in the community that fits them better, that is their specific avatar. Your client will be better off and you will be better off. And then you have to wow your clients. I spoke about that a lot before as well. And I think that we sometimes say, hey, I got the order. But how do you wow them? How do you say, hey, thank you for your order. Give them the attention they need to feel secure that they did the right thing when they chose you as their person to, to get into their world and expose their business to and get help from you to solve their problems. And customer relationships is also about how do you communicate with your clients? What kind of tools do you use? And find out if that idea clients the most on Facebook Messenger. You need to be there if you don't want to. That's not up to you. It's actually up to them. You can say that I, I prefer this, but they have to choose. So you can support them the right way for them. Find a way to do self-service maybe for Q and A's, maybe do marketing automation or automate some processes to get them the service they need at the right time when they need it, when you're not in the office or you're not available to answer to them. And if you are a sole entrepreneur, find maybe someone else that can help and handle your support on a different time zone in the Joomla community. That can just say, hey, I'm responding, I'm gonna leave a message, that person is gonna help you at that time. That's going to be a, such a better way of servicing the clients. And we have that capability in our ecosystem to do it. And then talk about channels. It's not just communication channels. It's actually delivery channels. It's buying channels, exposure channels. Like the guest that had been on my show has been exposed in a channel that was not available before. If you look at if you have an extension, is your extension listing on the JED updated enough? Or can you go in and do some more keyword optimization so you found better? Do you have referrals and references and happy clients saying something on your extensions on JED? If not, 
get them to do that so you have that in place in your channel. That's the most important one for you to be found. If you are a service provider, you have the resource directory. Is that listing the best listing you can do? Maybe that would be something that you can improve on and make more of to be more found. Do you have a process every single time you deliver a website to a client that you can showcase on the showcase page in Joomla, in the showcase directory? If you don't have a routine to ask your client, is it OK to share it? We will not get enough of good exposure to Joomla overall. And your reference is good for also the whole community, because sometimes they ask for, hey, I want to know if there is a plumber having a site in Joomla. I want to know if there is a bank who has a, a site on Joomla. And if someone else has already provided that, they can say, hey, it works for your industry too. And that would be helpful for everyone. So figure out what you can do with your channels. There is a lot of partners helping each other as well with links and saying, hey, I don't do this work, but I have partners around the world that do this work. And here's link to their websites. So you can have the same customer, the same ideal customer, but you can service them on different ways and help them to choose someone in our community instead of somewhere else. Because they have a need for it. And you will be helpful to help them do the right recommendation. And then we have the revenue streams, the money. Jason had been talking about subscriptions and how he's been utilizing that in his business. Maybe that could be some session you can, if you didn't watch it, go and look at it again, see if that could fit your needs. Be creative on how you can set up your, your business proposition to your clients. Maybe they cannot pay f all of them at the same time. Maybe you can have a payment plan. Maybe you can have retainers. They maybe have prepaid sessions. How can you figure out how to price your product and services so it's attractive to your ideal client? And there has been a lot of discussion about that as well at this conference. So see if you can work on that part of your business due to that new, new knowledge. It could be partnership, affiliation. It could be promotion campaigns, coupons. Uh, sometimes I know there is extension developers saying, hey, let's do a, a uh, Valentine uh, promotion together instead of doing one on one. There is a lot of things we can do that can help to strive the whole community forward, not just one person. And then we have the contacts. All the people that you connected with here have a plan on how you follow up with them. Have a one-to-one -one conversation with them afterwards. See if you can find something that you can do together to boost each other's businesses. But just getting a, like a person more liking your page or getting a new LinkedIn contact is not going to cut it. We need to have this conversation, say, hey, this is what I do. What do you do? How can I help you? And then we will be stronger together. And also, if there was some uh, partner that was a sponsor today uh, or this weekend, if they have a service that you thought it was really good, how are you going to follow up on that? How are you going to present that to your clients? Maybe one-on-one -on -one conversation with them to make it easier for you to sell the, cli the clients on that service because you're going to be teach by them. So figure out a way of getting that contact really into place. And the next step is to look at the key activities. And key activities could be, I want to watch all the J and Beyond series videos that I couldn't watch when I was having conversations with others or if I was in other sessions. So make sure that you take that uh, usability for you, because that could be a really th good thing. Uh, the GDPR, everyone in this room needs to be compliant in a few weeks. If you haven't done it yet or you are not final with it, you should do that in your key activities. If you haven't had partnership before and now you will go into partnership with others, maybe there is new contracts you have to figure out how to do them as a good key activity. And if you now are starting bundling your service or collaborating with others, you might need to work on a workflow process, how you're going to deliver together on the value proposition. So I use this to like a to-do list so I can really make sure that I do the right thing and on the most important 
box. So this is also where you can have a note that you always have in this box, which is work on your business. Schedule time to work on your business to make all these things happen in the right order. Maybe it's volunteering to Joomla that would be a key activity. Maybe it would be speaking at two or three Joomla days next year. That might be key activities. Who do you need to contact? Who do you need to do? When do you have to submit your papers? And put that into your key activities to get your voice out there and share. And then we have the uh, key resources. What kind of resources do you need to have the value proposition in place for your clients? It could be the new extensions that you found, or the new partners, or the new hosting. It could be that you have a new workflow since you have new partners. It could also be that you are hiring new team members. It might be that you actually need to get some money and raise your prices because you need to have more resources to make your bigger vision in a place that you want. So all those things can you map down on those kind of areas. And then we have the cost. What is the cost base of your business? And the more I talk to small business owners and smaller companies, I realize that they don't pay themselves enough as a salary. Uh, they don't have a pension plan for themselves. Uh, they might not even allocate enough money to go to conferences and keep up with the industry information and knowledge. If they want to be more seen, they might have to raise their budget when it comes to marketing and sales. Maybe they have to have a less, like a, like a new cost that is commission or an affiliate fee to someone. And that means that that's a new cost, but it should also be more revenue. So look at what the cost structure is and think about what the costs are most, most important for you to deliver your pr value proposition and what you need to do less of uh, and try to get out of. So if you have a lot of more subscriptions to services that you don't need, take them out, do other things with that money that actually is going to service your business or yourself better. And uh, something new that I thought of going to add on my cost structure is also legal advice with GDPR. To have someone look at my papers after I'm done doing the first revision of them. So I think that we have more, more things that we can add on that list than we had before. Can you see how this can be helpful for you? Yes, good, good. So the next thing that we do in our mastermind when we had had a short training is that we do some uh, live masterminding and discussion about this. So now I'm going to see if we can find Ron and Joe. Hey guys, you are now on the big screen. I moved. <laughs> okay. Good morning again. So Sarah, one of the things that I think is really important for this particular topic uh, is the whole cost and pricing idea. How do we come up with a proper costing for or pricing for a new venture or a new product and things like that? Uh, one of the things that I have found really helpful is an app called, um, I'm just bringing it up, Meta Canvas, M-E-T-A Canvas. What that does for you is it allows you to actually plug in the numbers into the business model canvas and actually calculates them for you on the fly. So if I want to charge you know, $29.95 for this new service or this new extension, how many people need to buy it before I actually break even or actually make money? Uh, what are my, and, it, and it actually calculates all the costs that you put up in the top section or in the bottom left section. Uh, and adds in all of the costs of all of the partners and other information that you're working with, and then gives you real-time feedback on, okay, so how many people are going to have to buy this thing at this price point before I make money? So you can, on the fly, adjust the price point and the numbers of people that you think might be interested in a particular product or service, uh, and then find the sweet spot. So 
that's invaluable because honestly, you could do it on paper, but all of those numbers, you know, can take time to really crunch through. So, uh, Meta Canvas is a really great app that goes along with this product. Good, uh, good advice, right? Joe, do you have anything that you want to add? Uh, when it comes to pricing, one of the things that you should know for sure is never underprice because once you set prices, you basically slot it yourself into a particular area and uh, you will build your reputation for your product and service based on that pricing. And the last thing you want to do is compete on pricing be a value proposition, not a commodity, and because it's very difficult to raise yourself out of the rat race or the horse race of being a commodity. But if you position yourself as a value proposition, then you will attract uh, a better clientele and have a much better opportunity for financial success. Anyone in the audience that want to say anything about this? What, what is the, the uh, box that you feel like you have to work fa like first on when you're going to go back and do some work on your business? All of them. All of them. Okay. That, thank you for being honest. <laughs> What kind of strategies do you need to have to not be a commodity? Absolutely. Yeah. And especially when you're competing on a global scale, uh, you know, those kind of support you do have to be very Yeah, so. So when you are a global community or you have a global set of customers, that is something that is more, when you are a commodity, you are pricing your prices and showing how many hours you're working and the, your hour work. And that's something that is something we need to stop doing. The client do not care how many hours you are spending on something. They want to know that you understand their problem, you have the solution and the skill set to give them the value that they need and the result that they need and give that as a and like an offer instead of saying, hey, this is how many hours and this is a price point. That is not as comparable as ours. So you're not gonna have the same problem as others. And if you can also niche yourself and not say, hey, I do everything for everyone, but I am actually doing websites for more for uh, um, car shops. That's what I do. I'm absolutely excellent in doing that. I understand their industry, I understand everything that they do, and I know the extensions I need, I know what kind of layout we need, I know what kind of functionality we need. Then you will be an expert in that field, and no one is going to be as competitive as before if you are everything for everyone. So you're asking the price point is different because people have different levels of exp like expenses or income and that's why money is hard to compare within different. And that's exactly that we cannot sometimes say yes to every client. We, you have to figure out what your ideal client is and what kind of part of the world do they have enough money to pay for your services. And you should not then try to sell to people that they do not have enough because you have your cost based in the left corner of this sheet and you have to cover that. You have to find clients that actually will be able to pay for your services, not just want them. And that's different. <laughs> we all want a lot of things that we cannot pay for. So you're talking about different pri different business models. You're talking about if you sell some service once, or if you have a repetition uh, from the same 
client as a subscription or something. Would uh, Joe, would you say something about this subscription method, if that's better than a one-time off project? Maybe you can see. Yeah, OK, so I can respond to it instead. Uh, I will say this, uh, that the it's hard and it's costly to get the first client. The first time you do a client work, it might not be even be profitable. It might be no margins because you had to take time to get to learn to know that client and what their business is all about if you don't have the expertise in that field like we said before. So in that case, it would be more profitable to have a like, repetition from that client because you already have that client and that's called client requisition cost. And then you would like to know how much the value of the client is for the long-term life of that client in your company. And instead of doing a one big client offering, dividing into payment plans or like a retainer or an ongoing work with monthly payments is usually easier for them for their cash flow. So it, it all depends on what kind of client you have. Sometimes we have clients that call us in November, December, and they have too much money left in their budget that they haven't spent yet. And if they don't spend it this year, they will have less in their budget next year. So they want us to invoice them the same year so they actually use it. And if I would say, hey, you have a payment plan, then that would not work. Because then they would say, well, I will go somewhere else where they can invoice me directly. So it all depends on what your client is and what their needs are, and you figure out how to package your service and how you sell it to them so it works for them and for you, because you need to be profitable so you don't undercut yourself. And like I said, doing the first couple of projects is usually not that profitable. Anyone has a, like from the group, have any thoughts on this that want to share? The cost structure is struggling, yes. Anyone has an advice on how to balance your income and your cost structure? Because that's what you were asking. You say that's hard. Sometimes you have less income and more cost, and then sometimes you don't ask for enough money from your client and the cost goes up. Yeah. Anyone has any thought on this? How do you solve it in your business? Do you want to share? No? <laughs> I think that's a problem for everyone. Uh, ah, so that's a, like a community problem. Okay, good. Then we have something to tackle, right? It's a good like challenge. But I think at some point, also it must have to be uh, sell to know your cost in order to obtain the first one. So why you know why I don't tell you? Well, I will only do that thing if I'm just starting out and I don't have reference and referrals because I need to have maybe a success delivery that I can show to other clients and say, this is how I do it, this is the result I can give that I gave to someone else, I can give you the same result. Then I should actually, in, in some cases, say yes to that kind of thing. But then they have actually have to say, I can use this for marketing purposes and things if they are happy with, with the product that I actually did. Uh, I know that Joe has been doing a lot of uh, um, thinking on how to do really good proposals. So he's really good at not undercutting his prices, which is good. Uh, Joe, can you please share how you think when you are doing a proposal so you keep your cost down? Oh, he doesn't hear anything. Do you know if he, he has no, oh, okay. Uh, so, uh, if it comes to the, uh, the cost, it's really, really important for... 
Ah, okay. Okay, Joe, do you hear me now? Okay. <laughs> and I can see what he's typing. Can you type the question? I could type the question, probably. Hello? Hello? Is this working? Maybe he can see this. Okay, doesn't work. Uh, okay, so uh, when it comes to, I know Kira, you are doing your prices so in, not by hours, you're doing a package saying, hey, I'm gonna deliver this for you for this amount of money. And then you will do some revenue calculation and say, hey, this is how many hours I actually thought I would spend and here's how much I could reuse from previous experience that I had, so I should have a margin so I don't overspend my hours, and then see what that works. So to do that kind of feedback loop after you have done a project, that makes it easy for you to do the ne next estimate to make sure that you then maybe add on more pricing because you know there will be two revisions. It's not going to be just one. <laughs> it's, you have to figure out how to, to do your business game. And by learning more about your clients and what kind of clients you attract. And if you like those kind of clients, maybe you should change something in your proposition that will fit their value proposition and their needs better. So it's a win-win for both of you. But you should get more paid for not over-delivering all the time. Yeah. Yes? Yes. Yeah, let me jump in there because I think that's a really good suggestion. It's something I've been doing now for a while as well. The idea of uh, really having a very crisp investigation process, getting to the exactly what the heart of the project is, and having that discovery process really outlined well in a document that says, okay, here's the scope of the project. Uh, here's how many hours it's going to take. Here's what scope creep means, and I always actually include that idea of scope creep in every contract I put out and every discussion that I have. And so when we get to that point and somebody says, one of the clients says, well, we really now want this, I'll just smile and go, all right, so let's go back to the contract. Let's go back to this discussion about scope creep and here's what it's going to cost you. Do you really want that as part of the project now or is that something that we can add on later? So. I really like the suggestion of talking more about an hourly rate. That becomes part then of really understanding how quickly you can build things, um, how, well you, how well you work and building that then into your cost structure. That's another reason I like the Business Model Canvas uh, app because I can actually throw those numbers in as well and it's gonna show me in an instant uh, how much I'm gonna make in an hour. So if the project now is gonna be 30 hours and I only, you know, I was thinking of saying, okay, the project's going to be, you know, $3,000. Well, I know I'm going to get a hundred bucks an hour basically, but if the project is now 60 hours, well, okay, now I'm in a little bit of trouble. So great suggestion. Uh, I think probably more of us need to think that way. I have two follow-up questions to that. Uh, Rod, what sort of specific language do you include in your contracts about scope creep? because um, I face um, different qualities of clients, clients who are really, really good at asking 
for my help and clients who leave me alone a little bit too much and you know one tends to dominate the other. So I'm interested in the Scope Creek language, but I'm also wondering if charging an hourly price basically flies in the face of what we just said about value-based pricing. I would much, much rather say I'm going to deliver you uh, service A for a thousand bucks and then it's my business if, if I need five minutes or a hundred hours for it, right? Okay, I'm going to really apologize because the echo in the room, I, I missed probably half of what you just said. Um, I know you've got a question about scope creep, but that's pretty much where I lost you. I am so sorry. So the scope creep is uh, something that he asked you what kind of wording you have in your contract oh. regarding it. Okay. So again, that goes back to the definition of the work. Um, my process, and I know Joe does this process as well. So a lot of, a lot of talk ahead of time uh, about what the work is. So is this just a new template? Is it a complete redesign? Is, are we building a whole new thing from scratch? And then making sure that every piece of the work is in place. Um, I get them to sign off on that ahead of time. So yeah, that takes a little bit of time. Um, and generally I'll charge for that as well. And if they don't decide to uh, use me as, uh, as their vendor of choice, then I still you know, get something out of it. Um, but then the language in the scope creep part is very specific. It says any, any requests beyond the work, and again, I just define that above, is called scope creep. And, and again, I actually use those words right in the contract. Um, Actually, I'd be happy to send a sample contract to Sarah, and and maybe she can um, we can post it somewhere and and uh, in, in some of the notes for the session or something. But yeah, so I, I actually use the word scope creep, and I actually verbally meet with a client, whether over the phone or in person, to go through the contract line by line. And when we get to that point, I use some something like along the lines of, so the work that we've in, we've agreed to do is what we've now agreed upon above. This is any other work that you ask for now as part of the project, as the project develops, will be considered scope creep. Uh, are you okay with that? And is the definition that we, of the work sufficient for you to be able to sign this and agree to this? Um, it's along those lines, but I always wor work through, uh, in a meeting, work through the entire contract before either of his signs. I hope that helps. Uh, again, not sure all of the other things you asked there. I have a, a comment that I'd like to throw in there too. So uh, in my particular agreements, I have something, a document that's called change management. And it simply explains that we have agreed to a particular uh, scope. And if we stay on track, then we are going to be able to control pricing and that there's no reason for a client not to want to change or add things along the way. However, if it impacts the project from a financial point of view, then that is flagged immediately and uh, we would then address a particular change that was outside the original intent of what we were doing and I would explain how that impacts what we're doing and especially with regards to costs and then submit to the client a, another estimate on the change that would be required to implement something outside of the original agreement. And that is how I manage change management. So if the client wants to add things, yes, they can, provided that they are, are able to pay for something that's outside the original agreement. And that's a change management system uh, that I would include for particular clients that are, are new, especially when you're working with people that you already know and you know how they work, usually you don't run into those things or hopefully you don't run into those things. But then you can do a kind of a mixed thing. You can do the value proposition offering and then say, this is what's going to be inside this, and this is the value I'm going to deliver. But if there is any change to this, here is my hourly fee. So sometimes they say, OK, you can do as many change requests you want within the first hour. That's included. 
And that's a good thing, right? It's like they can do unlimited changes, but it cannot take more than one hour to do it. That could be included. So you can think of what kind of things do your client really want and figure out how to scope that into your project. And if there are changes, which there always is, they know on, on top or in front that it's going to cost money. So these are kind of really good questions. Any other questions that you want to bring up that comes from the business model canvas work thing that we did that stands out that you want to declare? way to, I mean, I know that the partners usually have added value to your business, right? They Or they help you somehow. But how do you spot them? Is there any, any way that you need to follow? I mean, how you approach them and what kind of uh, offer you can give? I mean, how you tell them it is good to make, to be partnered with you. So, okay, the proposition value and all that, that's one way for sure. But is there a way that we can follow? Mm, I mean, so when I work with partners, I try to find them that I enjoy working with. They think that I can see what they previously have done, that that actually is on the same standard of delivery that I would like them to do for my clients. But I don't think enough is like one way partnership that one person is going to get to partner with you and then someone is earning on it, but not the other one. I think there needs to be a more a symbiosis of partnership, more a strategic partnership, instead of just a promotional partnership with affiliation links. I, I see that kind of partnership much more valuable because you invest in your relationship on how to service both of your clients the best way by utilizing each other's strength instead of trying to do something ah, kind of good, but the other thing really, really well. That is kind of uh, not as good value proposition delivery. But if you partner with someone who says excellent here and you're really good at here, together that delivery will be much better. Mm -hmm. And you can, if you have the same uh, customers or the idea customers, you can really service both of them really well. Mm -hmm. But I would say that you need to have a partner contract so you know who, who owns the client relationship. And if they want to buy more, who, who are they going to go to first? Even if they want to buy from the other partner, that's fine, but there needs to be someone who's actually responsible for the client and having that first connection with the client and fronting the client. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Jason. I had a shout out to you before and said thank you for being on the show and sharing your business advice with us. Yeah, so Joe and Rod. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm going to do this because we're going to go into, yes, the closing parts of the thing here. Here's the mastermind. If you have enjoyed this, I would love to have you on our Zoom call that we have every other week. We talk about uh, twice a month we meet and we have a conversation like this. We bring up a topic that is really, really interested for some of the people that are in the room and we then have a mini training on it. Sometimes we bring in experts and uh, they, they explain something for the group of business owners that would like to know more of this. And then we have a discussion on that topic and how we can put that into play in our business right now and make it actionable. So it's not just a training and saying, hey, that was good inspiration, but really making a difference in our businesses together. And then we have a Facebook group and you have recordings and stuff if you are a member of this group. But I would like to invite you to yes, stay on a call for free to experience how this is. Because I think that together we can grow our business. It's much faster and much more profitable and much more sustainable over time. And I think that's the key point for Joomla, for us to be more profitable so we can share more and do more for Joomla as well. Because we all do services on Joomla, we all have our income from Joomla, but Joomla needs us also to contribute in different ways as small business owners. So if you want to be part of that, uh, give me a shout out on any of the social medias and I will give you the link to the next one. We will then talk about how to deal with difficult clients. So that's going to be really, really interesting to see what that conversation goes and what kind of experience and things that we're talking about at that time. So please join us. 
And since we don't have too much voice from the guys, so I will say thank you from all of us for joining this session. And we really tried to do something that we haven't done before with the video link and everything, but it worked kind of okay, th I think. Did you think so? Yeah. yeah. It's good to have people be able to share their knowledge, but they can't attend maybe. So instead of attending, they can be on the video link. So thank you so much for participating today.